Hey, good morning. Welcome to City View Community Church on this uh, fifth Sunday, I guess, that we are meeting together and here online. And we are just going to continue uh, with the, the question, what did resurrection really do? What did it do? We're going to build on that for the next uh, couple, three weeks and just try to grow into that and learning about living the attributes of the resurrected life. We're going to learn that and dig into it and grow together. God bless you. Hey, won't you just come on with me? Let's go into the sanctuary and join in.
guys. Here we are, stuck at home like the rest of you. Sure wish we could be in church with you, but since we are stuck at home, I can't think of anybody I'd rather be stuck with than you. I love you. No, that's very sweet, but I love you more. No, I love you more. No, I love you more because I'm bigger. Whatever. Well, let me tell you about some big love. John 3, 16 tells us that God loved us so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Now, that's what I call loving you more. And your expression of your big love has been your faithfulness. And I thank God that we have a church full of people that love God, love his word, and are enabling us to continue the gospel coming out of City New Community Church. Amen. So thank you for that. We want you to stay faithful to that. Let me encourage you. God is going to bless you, and I know he is blessing you. Won't you tell them how to give? You can give by texting 940-400-0275, or you can go to the website, www.cityviewmw.com. Dot com, or you can even snail mail it to P.O. Box 67, Mineral Wells, Texas, 76068. And just remember that God loves you more. Keep up the good work, and that's big love because he's bigger.
We talked about last week a little bit about the resurrection of Jesus being that it was Easter. And I wanted to continue that line of thought this week and even next week, possibly the week after that, of talking about living in the resurrection life. And what I want to speak to you about today is the attributes, or begin a couple of Sundays, on the ideal of the attributes of the life lived in the power or in the light of His resurrection. Uh, not that I'm an expert on that, or, uh, but I'm trying myself to grow into it, to increase to it, to allow my faith to reach for it, not removing the standards of the Word of God, but fulfilling the Word of God as Christ did in His life. That's the power of the life in resurrection. So I want to deal with the attributes of that. First Peter chapter 2, we got into it a little bit last week when he was giving us instruction uh, about uh, growing uh, in holiness. And get, he's showing us that Christ, first and foremost, is our source. He said in verse 1, So put away uh, all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. That is the life in resurrection to me. That by it you may grow up into salvation. Our salvation is so much greater than just a momentary experience. Please, please don't misunderstand me. Our salvation through Christ is so much greater beyond the tomb than it is or beyond the altar where we died to self and were buried with Christ, and then we were resurrected with Him, but we're to go on and grow and mature in our faith. It's, it's so much, salvation is so much greater than just getting our ticket to heaven. It's a life that is more abundant in Him, in Jesus' name. So he says, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, chosen and precious. And so he told us to clean, in the message it says, to clean our house, to, to let him become the source of our life, to allow him to become the source of our life. I, I want to read to you verse 4 uh, uh, from, the, from the message. It says, welcome to the living stone, the source of life. The workman took one look and threw it out. God set it in the place of honor. We've got to get our life up to the scale or up to the level where we're not living according to human understanding. Human understanding is based in human emotions. And so we see the destructive, the most destructive force in our world today is the spirit of fear. 
But we that live in the resurrected life of Christ, we are, we are welcome to the living stone. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, Jesus walked on the waters of the storms of life. He walked on them. They faced him not. They, didn't, they did not disturb his peace in any way. So we're to live connected to the living stone. He is the source of our life. He is first and foremost the portion of our life. And secondly, he is the source of our life. But uh, Peter goes on to write that he's also in verse 6, he says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Your faith will not be shamed. Your de declarations of the grace of God in your life will never be disappointing to you. There will be trials. There will be tests. The Passion Translation says, For it says in Scripture, Look, I lay a cornerstone in Zion, a chosen and priceless stone, and whoever believes in Him will certainly not be disappointed. Whoever trusts in this stone as a foundation will never have cause to regret, to regret it, says the message to us. So I want you to understand today that the Lord Jesus is our portion, yes, and He is the strength of that. So He says in verse 7 and 8, So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Christ is more offensive today than I think in the history of mankind. His message is more offensive today. There's more struggle of trying to press that, that, that message down. They're trying to create so much fear that it will overcome our faith. I declare to you in the name of Jesus, the cornerstone of our faith is Jesus himself who didn't fear, did not, he did not fear death. He did not fear any form of destruction or threats or disease or illness or anything. And we have been resurrected with him into that life that is free from the spirit of fear. It's a stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. They disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. That's a very sad statement to me. They keep stumbling over the message because they refuse to believe it. And this they were destined to do. Uh, so as we, 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 we look at this, verse 9, but you are a chosen race. That's me and you as believers. You are a chosen race. We didn't choose him. He chose us. Thank God that he did. Thank God that he did. Thank God that he did. He chose us a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. This is only found in the resurrected life of Jesus Christ, that we are bonded to him, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are in the mercies of God. The power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the strength of God's mercy in our life. It is our strength. It is our, our value. It is our worth. It is our possession because we are His and He is ours. He is the value. He's the one that has purchased it all for us. I, I just I want to scream at you and say, can I get an amen? Because what a powerful. And then Peter begins to go into, in verse 11, it starts beginning to be very, very powerful here. He begins to give us instructions for life or showing us that the resurrected Christ, the resurrected Christ is the mentor for our life. He is the example of, of our life and for our life. He is the one that we press toward the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That is our example. So Peter begins to speak. He says, Beloved, 
I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. We don't want to be disobedient children. It's not grace plus anything. Oh, I heard a powerful message last Sunday morning uh, from Pastor Robert Morris in, in South Lake, Texas. Powerful message on grace as, the, as part of the very character of God. And the Bible, and he declared that with the strength of the Word of God, that grace stands alone. It's not grace plus works. It's not grace plus anything. It is grace. And boy, he set me free because one of my great fears in my life, or one of my great concerns, is that possibly every sin I have ever committed could be, as Pastor Morris called it, stupid sin. I call it willful sin because I was never... A, 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 we talk about young people, and, but I was never ignorant of the Word of God. I was taught all the way up in my life the power of the Word of God and the truths of the Word of God. So I've always been concerned as a pastor, as a Christian, as a quote-unquote man of God. I've always been concerned, how does God deal with my willful sin? Oh, and it set me free because... It's not grace plus anything. I am forgiven. So through that power of that forgiveness and that resurrection, I have the ability to abstain from the passions of the flesh. As we said last week, there is literally an ability to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Tearing down those strongholds, these things that war against our soul. We have authority over them through the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. That means out in the world to us. As we go about everyday life, keep our conduct honorable out there. Keep it Christ-like. Don't submit yourself to the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. Don't do that as Christians. Don't be saying one thing with your mouth and saying another with your actions. It has nothing to do with being saved or not saved. It has everything to do with living as the resurrected life of Christ gives us the example. Keep your conduct among Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The only hope out there is the body of Christ. We are the Christ now on earth. We are His children. We are His apostles. We are His teachers. We are His preachers. We are His evangelists. We are, we are the fivefold ministry. We are operating in the spirit of prophecy. Because Revelation tells us that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. We are the prophetic voice of the Lord Jesus in the year 2020. In the midst of all that is going on in the world, the craziness, it is a pandemic. But not necessarily just a virus. It's a pandemic of fear and a misunderstanding and of ignorance and lack of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So where do we walk? This is the attributes of the resurrected life. He says in verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. That's why we declared and most pastors declared at the beginning of all this, let's be good citizens. Because the scripture tells us as resurrected life operates in us, we can allow ourselves or, or choose to be subject to the Lord's, or for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Good will win out every time. If there is a larger agenda to the fear-mongering, if there's a larger agenda to all of that, that many of us that operate in the prophetic realm of understanding. If there's a large agenda, good will knock it down every time. Our good will win. 
So don't be afraid to be subject to every human institution because our good will win. Verse 15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Just allow the power of that resurrected life to rule and reign in your heart because good will overcome evil every time. Good will overcome evil every time. Live, verse 16, as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. I say yea, Lord, today, to the purposes and the will of God, because good, truth, will overcome evil and lies every time, every time. Can I get an amen? Verse 17, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Uh, fear God. Honor, on, honor the, the, the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. This flies in the face of radical Christianity. This is radical Christianity. Living in the resurrected life is radical Christianity. Because Jesus, they would smote him and he would turn the other cheek. Everything that he has told us to do, he exemplified. He became our strength and our worth and our value and our mentor in all of that by suffering himself. By suffering himself. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrow. Listen to it. When one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. It's a gracious thing when it's done in the mindfulness of God. The resurrected life is always mindful of the Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Paul would say, for this light suffering that we're dealing with now is nothing compared to the weight of the glory that's coming. Remember, we talked about last week that we show up in his, his death, his life, his resurrection. We'll also be present in his glory at the finality. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good, and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to, for to, uh, let me get, for to this you have been called. We have been called to this life because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, leaving you an example so that you might follow his steps. He told us, listen to me, listen to the word. Give me ear. He told us, I send you out amongst wolves that are in sheep clothing. He told us that he sent us forth out there that we would suffer trials and tests and tribulations for the kingdom's sake. But he said, while you're in this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer because he had overcome the world. That's that resurrected life. That's where we are to live. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. You know, I got a feeling that old excuse, well, I'm not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. I don't think that's going to carry any weight because we, were, we died with him and we were resurrected with him. And we have that power and that grace in us. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body. Remember, he never said a word. He never cursed. He never replied. The only thing he ever said was to a man, you say so. You know, when he was questioning, being questioned about being the king of the Jews. Listen to verse 24. This is the crux to me of this part of the message of what did resurrection do? 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. We relate that pretty much solely to the physical existence. No, this is eternity. This is the resurrected life. By his wounds, by the scars that are in his hands, the scar on his side, the scars in his feet, the scars around his brow from the crown of thorns. By his wounds, from the beating of the whip. All those who, yes, it's for physical healing, but it's that we are healed completely from the life of the flesh and of sin. And we have been brought into a life of resurrection. Resurrection. That life is a life more abundantly. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying, verse 25, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. I would say again, in the words of the message of Paul, in the, in the message, act like it. Act like it. I know one of the greatest revelations, and we'll continue this next week, but one of the greatest revelations that I received, I've, I've received some strange things. I, I think strange things when I'm at funerals at the graveside. I've, I've, I've been standing with my hand on a casket saying the last words over the, the deceased and for the family and receive complete revelation and a message and a sermon and understanding of God. He shows us great and mighty things. And a few years ago, I was standing at the, uh, just outside of Mineral Wells here at a grave of a very good friend's mother who had passed and that people that I had known many, many years and many of you knew her and knew them and know them. But I was standing at the grave and my good friend Guy Weathers was, was doing the committal. We, were, we had combined and we were partnered up, partnered up on doing this lady's funeral. And Pastor Guy just referenced from the book of Job as Job spoke, and he spoke that in the end, and in the word that's there is Redeemer, that Job declared that even though he was eaten by worms and all of these things, you know, the destruction of the body, the corruption of the body, and all this, and he died, and all those things, he said, I will see my Redeemer. I know my Redeemer lives. So as far back, and I've heard scholars say, I've read, where they say Job is the oldest book in the Bible. I don't know. I'm not a scholar. But I understand that that standing there that day in that moment, and I, I don't know how many times I had read that scripture before. I don't know. But suddenly it just turned a light on in my heart and in my spirit. The power of a resurrected life is not a new thing. It's not just a New Testament belief. It's not a New Testament creation. But since from before time began, the Bible says that before all the time and everything began, before the foundation of the world was laid, the Lamb was slain. So it's, this is an old thing, but we are growing to that. We are being built into a righteous and holy habitation of God together. And we are all linked and tied to the cornerstone that God laid in Zion. So I encourage you today, if you don't know Christ, if you don't know this and you haven't experienced any of this kind of resurrected living, my God, today's the day. Everything in this world, out in the world, is tied to human emotion. And human emotions are going to fail every time. Because when a storm comes, we become, in, when we're locked in human emotion, when there's a storm of life, whatever that storm might be, it can be a loss, it can be a market crash, it can be, it can be a virus, it can be all kinds of things. But if we're locked into the world of human understanding, it's based in emotions. And when the storm comes, we're blown about by every wind 
of doctrine. I'm so impressed with the ideal of the old farmer out there and the ranchers because when they go through drought, invariably you see many of them cleaning out their water holes in the midst of drought. They use drought, the time of drought, for our time of cleaning. We're to clean our house often, the Lord says, in remembrance of Him. We are to purge ourselves of unbelief and come back and live in the power and the overcoming power of the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. Let me pray with you and for you and I. Lord, I thank you. God, you have moved me today. I pray that anyone that sees this, that somehow my simple way of presentation, God, I just trust it was your Holy Spirit that was speaking and that you are speaking to hearts right now and changing lives forever. God, let us see that when we are weak, you are strong. And we are to be strong in the power of your might. We're to press on to the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Forget all those things that are behind. Press on. Lord, let this be a time of a purging of our own houses. God, let this be a time where we unhook ourselves from the fast train of, of flesh living, carnal living. And we hook ourselves back to the chief cornerstone that you laid in Zion. Let him be our portion. May we allow him to be the source of our life. May we allow him to be our strength, God, our worth, our value. And may he become, Jesus become, the mentor of our life, of the way we live and exist. Because, Lord, it is in you that we exist. We live and breathe and have our being. We live and move and have our being. In Jesus' name, bring comfort out there, God. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your word. Let's give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for that encouraging word today. And I'm looking forward to the next few weeks as we continue to explore this resurrected life. But I want to remind those of you out there that we are called to be more than hearers of the word, but we are called to be doers of the word as well. So I want to encourage you to not only join in, but to like and comment and be a really join in and be a part of our services, both on Sunday and Wednesday. We have another way of connecting, and I would like for Chris to tell us a little bit more about that. So if you've been watching the services on Facebook or YouTube, and you've not connected with the church before, we just want to get to know you a little better. So if you will, please email us at guest at cityviewmw.com. That's G-U-E-S-T at cityviewmw.com. Uh, you're going to get a reply in just a couple of minutes with a quick questionnaire that we just would like for you to fill out so we can get to know you and your family just a little bit better. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And just remember that even if it's online, you, you belong, belong here. here.